Personally, I wish a woman would stay in the home and do the kitchen work, take care of the babies. Can't would you wait. like to apologize? Uh, no. After watching WTA star Mira Andreva play against a male player ranked 1,000 spots below her in a bizarre face-off at a French exhibition, and then watching the United Cup and all the drama that followed at the beginning of the year, it got me wondering all over again. What would happen if a man and a woman played against each other in tennis? To many of you guys, that question might sound a little dumb, but in reality, literally no other question in the history of the sport has generated as much drama, intrigue, debate, and speculation as this subject. Why is that? Let me tell you. Okay, so the idea of men and women facing each other has actually played out quite a few times, the most popular of them being the famous Battle of the Sexes. Girls play a nice game of tennis for girls, but when they get out there on a court with a man, even a tired old man of 55, they're going to be in big trouble. It's Thursday, September 20th, 1973, and we come across a 55-year-old Bobby Riggs, who happened to be one of the best players in the world during the 1940s, and was ranked world number one on multiple occasions with six majors to his name. Well, he wasn't just a former player at this point. He was also a well-known tennis promoter and a hardcore gambler. You see, back in 1939, Riggs bet on himself to win the Wimbledon singles, doubles, and mixed doubles in England. He ended up winning everything and making $105,000, which is the equivalent of over $2.2 million today. But Riggs couldn't take the money out of England because of World War II and its devastating effects. Seven years later, in 1946, the money had grown to an even bigger sum because of the interest accrued on his winning. To think that Riggs won that much money with only $500, and at a time when most betting was illegal in England, should have registered in the minds of fans. But it didn't. The 1970s came, and 55-year-old Riggs publicly criticized then 29-year-old Billie Jean King and her efforts in fighting for equal pay for women. The stakes were high, and we were about to witness a once-in-a-lifetime spectacle. King had earned her fifth year-end world number one the previous year, and would finish second to Margaret Court in 1973. In Riggs' words, a woman's place is in the kitchen and in the bedroom, and not necessarily in that order. Yeah, I know the 40s were a different time for sure. Well, to settle the debate, both players agreed to play against each other, with each keen on proving their point. There was a winner-takes-all prize of $100,000, the equivalent of about $659,000 today. The event was held in Texas at the Houston Astrodome and immediately broke records as the most televised sports event and the most watched tennis match of all time, being viewed by an estimated 50 million people in the United States and 90 million more worldwide. It pretty much had an anticlimactic ending, with King beating Riggs in straight sets, 6-4, 6-3, 6-3. In the first set, King fell behind 3-2 after Riggs broke her serve, but she broke right back and again in the 10th game to close out the set. The next two sets saw King remain mostly at the baseline rather than her usual aggressive game, and she found it easy to handle Riggs' soft shots while making him cover the entire court as she moved him from side to side. Seeing that he was being beaten at his own game, Riggs showed a more serious demeanor and switched to a serve and volley tactic, but King simply outclassed him and won the match convincingly. After the match, Riggs said that he underestimated Billie Jean King, who hit outright winners on 68% of her shots. Uh, Billie Jean was super that night, as you know, played a fantastic game, and uh, I wasn't in it. She won a decisive victory and I have no excuses. All I can say is that I'm not discouraged. I'm still the same guy. I still feel the same as I always have. Uh, I uh, had said before the match that I was going to win it, that there'd be no contest, and I was wrong. She said that uh, they were going to scrape me off the floor of the Astrodome. They didn't quite have to do that, but almost. But I uh, uh, would like to uh, get into a real serious frame of mind and, and maybe go through a, a little tougher practice uh, uh, routine than I had uh, at this one, and I would love to play her again. But something didn't quite feel right. Not trying to stir the pot here or anything, but it just looked like Riggs was just one smart aleck who out-hustled everyone. You see, earlier that year, something happened. Riggs had been taunting female tennis players for some time. A well-known master promoter of himself and of tennis, Riggs claimed that the female game was way inferior, and that even at his current age of 55, he could still beat any of the top female players. Sounded like he was up to something, but fans didn't know exactly what it was at the time. Riggs would then initially challenge Billie Jean King, who he called the sex leader of the Revolutionary Pact, but she declined. Why do you think she did? Well, Margaret Court stepped in and accepted the guaranteed $20,000 for the high-profile exhibition match, 
which apparently was more than she had earned for winning both the 1973 Australian and French Open women's singles titles. Court was 30 years old at the time and had recently returned to the tour after giving birth to her first child the previous year in March 1972. Interestingly, she had even negotiated with Riggs to increase the prize money, as she was confident she would win. The D-Day arrived, and about 5,000 fans came to the Mother's Day match in Ramona, California. Riggs used his drop shots and lobs to ragdoll court and keep her off balance. The result was a quick 6-2, 6-1 victory. The decisive match win landed Riggs on the cover of both Sports Illustrated and Time magazine, and then he publicly taunted King with his win. Why? Simply because she had bigger fish to fry. King had no other choice than to accept the challenge at this point. So with everyone favoring Riggs to come out with another straightforward victory, his loss to King shocked everyone. Which brings us back to the match. Riggs, being a world-renowned hustler, hyped up the event and then annihilated Margaret Court earlier to have all the odds in his favor before seemingly throwing the match for a bigger payday against King. The word on the street was that Riggs had a history of gambling debts and supposedly owed some Mafia members huge amounts of money, so he deliberately lost the match to settle off those debts, which were over $100,000, but this claim hasn't been decisively proven. Based on his poor play and large number of unforced errors, many thought that Riggs had bet against himself. Following his loss to King, the allegations rolled in. Many critics were less impressed by King's victory, pointing out the fact that she was 26 years younger than Riggs. Martina Navratilova in 2023 said that the reason the 55-year-old Riggs lost to the 29-year-old King was simply because of age. In her words, Bobby was too old, and that a 35-year-old Bobby would have beaten all of us. Others stated that King didn't play well during the match. According to Riggs' son, his father did know quite a few mob leaders and met with them several times in the weeks leading up to the matchup with King. But King was having none of this, saying that she knew what tanking looked and felt like, but refused to believe that Riggs lost the match on purpose. According to King, the match was more than a publicity stunt. Hmm. Now to the elephant in the room, what do you guys think about the match and Riggs' performance? But beyond all debate, Billie Jean King's victory set the ball rolling for social change and financial equality, and it was a significant milestone in the public acceptance of women's tennis, which has been incredible. It really was about social change. Mm -hmm. Women came, have come up to me since that match. That match has been mentioned every day of my life since that match, by the way. Really? I don't, unless I stay in the apartment and don't ever go out. The women got a lot more self-confidence from that. But while many super fans remember these two battles between men and women, not many remember these next couple of others. Less than two years after the famous battle of the sexes, and for the first time ever in the history of the sport, a woman entered a men's tournament. Officially. But it didn't end well, which is probably why we don't often hear of it. Former top 20 player and arguably now the richest tennis player ever, Jan Tyriak, faced then 18-year-old Connecticut woman Abigail Maynard on an indoor carpet court in their first round match at the then co-ed men's pro circuit, or what we now know as the ATP Tour of USTA's Fairfield County International Tennis Championship. Before the match, Abby's coach claimed that she had beaten many men and was one of the best around, and she was keen on proving that she could compete with the men on the ATP Tour. Well, a 6-love-6-love six six -love scoreline didn't help any of those claims. It didn't matter anyway, but that match ended up being the only one she played on the ATP Tour. 19 years after the famous Battle of the Sexes, another showdown happened. Now called the Battle of Champions, we saw two all-time greats face off against each other. This time, we had 40-year-old Jimmy Connors and 35-year-old Martina Navratilova at opposite sides of the net. But unlike the somewhat political nature of the first two matches, this was literally created for fun, entertainment, and as you would expect, money. A handicap system was introduced, with Connors being allowed only one serve per point, and Navratilova allowed two additional feet of alley on Jimmy's side. Despite the handicap system, Connors won the match 7-5-6-2, but it was a little awkward in some way. The play was slow and lackluster at times, with both players close to their retirement, and just like the previous encounters between men and women, we were still yet to see what we really wanted. A male versus a female tennis player, both at the peak of their powers with no handicaps whatsoever. Interestingly, Connors would admit about 20 years later that he also had a serious gambling problem and that he bet $1 million that he would beat Navratilova in straight sets and lose no more than eight games in total. I also found it a little funny that Navratilova had previously turned down invitations to take on John McEnroe and Illy Nastasi, saying that she considered them unworthy of the challenge. At the end of the day, both Connors and Navratilova received a $650,000 guarantee, while Connors took home another $500,000 for winning the match. 
I almost forgot to mention that between 1975 and 1992, there were a couple of other challenges between men and women, but they were mostly either handicapped singles, doubles, or mixed doubles. Bjorn Borg defeated three-time major winner and former world number two Virginia Wade 6-3 in a one-set match, while Ily Nastasi would lose to Australian former world number one player Yvonne Gulagong 5-7 in 1975. Ten years later in 1985, Bobby Riggs was back at it again. Now 67 years old, frail, and with deteriorating health, Riggs must have thought he could pull off another one. He partnered with Vitas Gerolaitis, who at the time was a top 20 player, and they faced off against Martina Navratilova and Pam Shriver. The match ended 6-3, 6-2, 6-4 in favor of the women. Not many fans took the match seriously because of the uneven playing field, but it was pretty nice to see men and women playing together. But things got a little more serious again in 1998 when the Williams sisters claimed they could beat any male player ranked outside the top 200 in the world. How did that turn out? In early 1998, during the Australian Open, Serena Williams and her sister Venus were on the cusp of becoming international tennis stars, and we had Karsten Brasch, a fading tennis star who was ranked 203 in the world. Brash was 30 years old at the time, while Venus and Serena were 17 and 16, respectively. For Brash, he wasn't really taken seriously with his funny serve and a training routine which was described as, quote, centered around a pack of cigarettes and more than a couple bottles of ice-cold lager, end quote. But when the Williams sisters claimed that they could take on any male player ranked outside the world's top 200, Brash must have taken that a little personally. He accepted the challenge and took on both sisters after a round of golf and a couple beers. The result? Brash beat Serena 6-1 before beating her sister Venus 6-2. Serena would later reflect after the set that she had hit shots that would have been winners on the women's tour. After the match, Brash insisted that there was no way the sisters would beat a man ranked inside the top 500, and that he had even taken his foot off the gas and played like someone ranked 600th against them just to keep the match interesting. But the Williams sisters didn't necessarily back down. They simply adjusted their claim to beating men outside the top 350. But interestingly, we didn't see them accept to play any male opponent after that match. Since this matchup, we've seen many hypothetical matchups being proposed, but no serious offers. When former world number ones Kim Kleisters and Leighton Hewitt were dating, Kleisters said that she struggled to win a point off Hewitt, let alone a game. Also, when Chris Everett was at her peak, she revealed in her autobiography that her brother, who played low-level college tennis, had in fact also beaten her. In December 2003, 43-year-old Yannick Noah, who some may not know as the father of former NBA player Joachim Noah, and 21-year-old Justine Hennen played each other in a friendly match at the Forest National in Brussels. Noah predominantly used trick shots and slices and won 4-6, 6-4, 7-6. But again, it was a friendly match. Nothing too serious. We saw something similar in 2013 when Novak Djokovic and Li Na played a lighthearted and comical five-game mini-set in Beijing, China to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the China Open. In 2017, it was Johanna Kanta versus retired male player Pat Cash in an exhibition match organized to celebrate the release of the film Battle of the Sexes. Yeah, a movie was made about the whole thing. In July 2021, it was Polish number one's Hubert Herkosz versus Iga Swiatek playing a single tiebreak game as part of the opening celebrations for the 2021 WTA Poland Open. Very recently in December 2023, and in an unusual turn of events, we saw teenage sensation and top 50 ranked Mira Andreva take on ATP world number 1145, Giannis Gajuani Durand in France. Giannis won the match in straight sets 7-5-6-2, but Andreva received the winner's trophy. It's all been fun in games up until this point, but let's get a little serious and see just how much controversy this topic has generated. By the way, if you'd like to stay current on all things Australian Open, you can't miss out on our Tennis Plus newsletter. You'll see the latest match updates and highlights, so if you're valuing sleep and not able to stay up into the early morning hours to catch the end of the Djokovic match, don't worry, we have you covered. Subscribe by clicking the link down below. Tennis legend John McEnroe came under fire in an interview for his comments about the greatest tennis players. Let's talk about Serena Williams. Best female player ever, no question. Uh, some would say she's the best player in the world. Why qualify it? Oh, uh, she's not, you mean the best player in the world, period? Yeah, best tennis player in the world. You know, why, why say female player? Well, because if she was a, if she played the men's circuit, she'd be like 700 in the world. Despite the loads of backlash he received, McEnroe doubled down on his comments, saying that anyone who is serious enough to want to see a real matchup between a man and a woman should have both the ATP and WTA tours combined. Yeah. The, the offer is this, is because it seems in tennis, unlike other sports that they're always asking about, 
how women, they always ask me how I would do for someone. Why isn't this old bag John McEnroe, how would he do against Serena? Why don't you combine, just solve the problem? I'm sure the men would be all for this. The men and women play together. And then we don't have to guess. Let me take you back to 2013 when Andy Murray said he would be up for a challenge against Serena Williams. Williams replied, that would be fun. I doubt I'd win a point, but that would be fun. So how did we get here? Here's what I think about the whole thing. There's really no need for men and women to face each other competitively. The aim has already been achieved thanks to King's efforts, and in many ways, the WTA is already independent and self-sufficient. But let's straighten out some things just for the sake of it. Men's tennis is completely different from women's tennis. Why? It mostly has to do with body size and biology. Men on average are taller, bigger, and with more muscle mass, which translates to more powerful serves, more brutal ground strokes, and faster and better ball recovery. It also means more endurance, too. In one quick summary, men are physically stronger than women on average. But that's just science. That being said, the women are extremely talented. You need to watch the WTA more often to see for yourself. Unfortunately, if they had to play the men, the women would most likely not win a tournament, and hardly anyone would even show up to those matches because it would just be unfair and stupid. That's just the reality. I believe we should embrace these differences as something positive rather than make a fuss about it. Even Serena Williams agrees with this fact. That's why she said this. Andy Murray, he oh, he was been joking about um, myself and him playing a match, and I'm like, Andy, seriously, like, are you kidding me? Because for me, tennis and men's tennis and women's tennis are completely almost two separate sports. So, I'm like, if I were to play Andy Murray, I would lose 6-0, 6-0 in five to six minutes, maybe ten minutes. Because it's, no, <laughs> no, it's it, true. It's honestly, true. It's a completely. Really. It's a completely different sport. The men are a lot faster, and me and um, they they get they serve harder, they hit harder. It's just a different game. Mm -hmm. And I love to play women's tennis, and I I only want to play girls because I don't want to be embarrassed. I would not do the tour. I wouldn't do Billie Jean any justice. So Andy, stop it. Yeah. We're not gonna. I'm not gonna let you kill me. The closest women come to taking on men is in mixed doubles, where they must serve and return to the male player half the time. And I honestly think that mixed doubles is a pretty great spectacle. I enjoyed watching the United Cup a couple of weeks ago, but what made it great was the team effort, not necessarily the men and women facing each other, which they technically did in some way. At lower and junior levels, women are more likely to defeat men because physical development is just starting for men at that time, and the playing field is a little more level because the biological differences aren't that defined at that point. It's the reason why Serena Williams could beat former world number one and Grand Slam champion Andy Roddick as a junior. Serena was 11 years old at the time, and Roddick almost a year younger than her. There is a small dispute over the score though, but both former players agree that Serena won. Serena says the score was around 6-1, but Roddick believes it was more like 6-4. Let's compare prime Andy Roddick to prime Serena Williams. Now you get the point. It just doesn't make any sense. I'd rather spend the time enjoying the quirks and action of both tours than create what I consider to be a funny gender argument. But as usual, I'd love to hear your thoughts and perspectives. Last year, the WTA Tour revealed a pathway for equal compensation that would see women and men receive the same prize money at all combined events by the year 2027 and all non-combined events by 2033. Personally, I think it sounds great, but I have seen a couple of comments on social media where fans feel like ATP players deserve more since they generate more revenue. Sounds like a valid argument as well, but what are your thoughts on that? And also, what are the biggest lessons you learned from the battle of the sexes? I also made a video about the entire business of tennis and what both men and women have to go through to make it to the top of the sport. So if you enjoyed this video, be sure to check it out here.